Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just here now to introduce the first session of the day, and it's climate change on the ground, land use, land use change, and forestry. Now, our first speaker, as the minister said, will be Professor Jim Ski, and he's going to provide an overview on the relationship between climate change and land use, including how land use change can contribute towards reaching net zero while protecting biodiversity and providing a sustainable food supply for the global population. Very briefly on Jim, he's Professor of Sustainable Energy at Imperial College London, with research interests in energy, climate change, and technological innovation. He is co-chair of IPCC Working Group 3. He was research director of the UK Energy Research Centre from 2004 to 12, and director of the Policy Studies Institute from 1998 to 2004. He was a member of the UK Committee on Climate Change from 2008 to 2018, and currently chairs Scotland's Just Transition Commission. And Jim has been nominated by the UK government as its candidate for the IPCC chair. So looking forward to hearing Jim now. OK, uh, th thank, thank you very much, Brian, and, and good morning, Minister. Good, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back in Ireland again. I've been a quite a frequent visitor over the years, so thanks to the EPA for in, inviting me back again. As Brian said in his introduction, uh, my history is rather as an energy person. But as co-chair of Working Group 3 of IPCC, we got the job of managing the production of the uh, IPCC special report on climate change in land. And whereas before that, I thought that energy was an incredibly complex topic, I was just uh, humbled by the complexity of issues relating to uh, climate change. And that understanding has been reinforced, actually, in my role as chair of the Scottish Just Transition Commission, where we have land use and agriculture firmly as part of our just transition activities to think about uh, the social and economic consequences of a transition to net zero. And just to say, the way that climate action interacts with complex issues such as land tenure is too, truly humbling. In Scotland, we have an unusually concentrated pattern of land ownership with a lot of tenant farming, and the way that interacts with incentives for climate change action are really a big challenge uh, to, to, to deal with. So I am going to base uh, the next few minutes basically on the IPCC special report on climate change in land, which was approved about almost four years ago now. And before doing that, I just want to acknowledge the big contribution that Ireland made to that. It was one of the countries that proposed that report. It hosted the scoping meeting. It hosted one of the lead author meetings. And Eamon Hockey from uh, Trinity, who I think is talking later in the programme, was seconded into our technical support unit to help us and did a great job on that. So I'm going to talk mainly about that special report on climate change in land, but I'm also going to introduce some elements from the synthesis report of this IPCC cycle, uh, which was approved two months ago in quite a painful and lengthy fashion in Interlaken in, in Switzerland. So, uh, first slide just, I think, reinforces some of the messages uh, that, that Laura uh, mentioned in, in her introduction. Land is the basis for human livelihoods and well-being. And it does supply multiple other ecosystem services. It supports the production of food, fresh water, and also the way we manage it does uh, relate to biodiversity. Uh, human use directly affects more than 70% of the ice-free land surface on the planet. And land also plays a very important role in regulating and is part of the climate change system. So just to underline the, uh, the, the second point that I, I was making there, this is the way that land is used uh, globally. Almost 40% of that is associated with pasture over the planet, uh, around 30% with uh, forestry, 
about 10% with cropland, uh, which, might, which starts to add up to that 70% of land use globally that is affected, uh, that, that, that human use uh, has actually influenced. Uh, I, I apologise for putting so many numbers on a slide, but, it, but I, I think it does help us get a sense of, of the context. These are the three most important greenhouse gases, obviously carbon dioxide most important, but methane also very, very significant, and importantly methane also has a short lifetime in the atmosphere, which also means that action on methane can reduce emissions and have an effect on global warming very quickly, which in the context of, with the prospect of, of reaching 1.5 degrees warming in the next five years is an important factor to consider. So in terms of carbon dioxide, uh, first of all, uh, roughly 10%-ish of global uh, emissions of human anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide come from the uh, forestry and other land use sector. That's what FOLU stands for. We must try not to use too many acronyms here. But these 5.2 gigatons that were identified in the special report are more than co uh, uh, compensated for by nat natural sinks of carbon dioxide. So land, if you take a kind of anthropogenic plus natural, is actually a net sink at the moment for carbon dioxide. Methane, uh, about 40% of global emissions are coming from agriculture, so very obviously a significant factor. And cattle and rice paddies are probably the, 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 two, the two most important sources there. And finally, for nitrous oxide, about 80% of nitrous oxide emissions associated with agriculture, essentially through the application of fertiliser. So the land use sector is a really, really important part of the balance of greenhouse gas uh, emissions, the, uh, both emissions and, and sinks. One other point we need to make is this graph actually goes back over about the last 60 years to about, about 19, 1960, but it shows how land use change and the intensification of the use of land have actually had many benefits for human beings it's with the increasing production of food, feed and water. So four trends indicated on this diagram Number one uh, refers to inorganic nitrogen fertilizer use. And since 1960, we've seen a factor nine globally increase in the amount of nitrogen fertilizer use. So a very big impact on, on productivity. Uh, we've seen a factor three increase in yields of cereal crops, which is obviously a very significant and beneficial output. But we've also seen a doubling of the amount of water that's used for ir irrigation and a 50, more than a 50% increase in the total number of ruminant livestock on the planet. So this is the, this is the big picture, and I think we can, you, we, we can probably put Ireland into, into that global picture as well. Now, for a couple of slides, I'm actually going to switch to the synthesis report and try to provide the context uh, for action on the land sector. And this is the slide that talks about carbon budgets. Uh, one of the big insights from our colleagues in Working Group 1 in the physical sciences is that global warming is almost linearly related to the cumulative amount of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere. Therefore, if you want to stop global warming, you need to get to net zero carbon dioxide emissions. And there is a limited carbon budget for cumulative CO2 emissions uh, that would be associated with any given level of warming. So on the left-hand side, we have the, the, that grey bar there is historical emissions up till 2019. And on the right-hand side in green, we have the remaining carbon budgets that would be associated with 1.5 degrees warming, which is about 500 gigatons, uh, about uh, 1,300 uh, gigatons, which would g give us a two-thirds two chance of limiting warming to two degrees. And you can see that the bulk of the total carbon budget has already been used up if you want to limit warming to these levels. 
And uh, we talked a, a little bit about the, the, you know, the en energy sector. Uh, at the bottom, it shows the projected lifetime emissions from fossil fuel infrastructure, which already exceeds uh, the uh, carbon budget for one and a half degrees, suggesting that there would be some stranded assets in the fossil fuel sector if we're going to limit warming to these levels. And uh, third from the bottom, we've got the emissions of CO2 that would occur over this decade if emissions remained constant at the 2019 level. And that will effectively exhaust the 1.5 degree, degree budget. So these are, the these are the challenges we've got. We've got a big challenge to, to get uh, emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions down. Now, one thing that IPCC did was to review uh, global modelled pathways, scenarios that limit warming to 1.5 degrees and other levels. The left-hand panel shows that what would need to happen uh, to greenhouse gas emissions over this century to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. The right-hand panel shows the same picture for 2 degrees warming. Uh, the blue lines refer to greenhouse gas emissions in aggregate, the purple line to carbon dioxide emissions, and the orange one at the bottom to uh, methane. And I'm just saying, I'm going to focus on CO2, but just to say, in both of these panels, you will see methane emissions going down by about a third in the very near future uh, if you are going to limit warming to these kinds of levels. The big message I want to, to pick out is that carbon dioxide emissions for one and a half degrees warming would need to reach net zero by around 2050, which is the basis for many targets that have been set by many individual countries. And if we were to limit warming to two degrees, uh, then this would be postponed to perhaps the 2060s or, or 2070. But carbon dioxide emissions do need to go to net zero this century to have anything like uh, the chance of getting to the ambition in the Paris Agreement. Greenhouse gas emissions net zero would always come later. It would come uh, in, in most uh, across the, in the middle of the scenario range almost in the year 2100 for 1.5 degrees warming. And in fact, in the middle of the range, we don't get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions in aggregate at all for two degrees warming. So that's the, the message I want you to hang on to, you know, for one and a half degrees net zero CO2 in 2050. But not all sectors are the same. And I think that was another important message, that you know, net zero is something that would be hit at a different time in different sectors. So this is showing out to the year 2050 the net zero years for, for different kinds of, 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 uh, of sectors and gases when net zero would be reached. And an important point to emphasize is that land use is the first sector to get to net zero carbon dioxide in these scenarios. It arrives at net zero CO2 globally around 2030, which is largely down to the effects of forest management when you, when you bury your way into the scenarios. Energy supply, which is essentially electricity, is a bit later into the 2040s. And in fact, uh, emissions from transport, industry, and buildings, the end use sectors, uh, they actually have a much slower decrease. And in these sectors, in fact, you do not really get to net zero at all during the 21st century. It's land use and electricity supply that, that really, really uh, bear, bear, the, bear the brunt of it. And non carbon. Uh, CO2 emissions, which includes methane and nitrous oxide, much of which is associated with agriculture and land use, uh, again, a much slower rate of decline in the longer term. So that's the, that's the, that's the kind of picture that we have uh, overall. From the synthesis report, uh, one of the things that uh, we identified was to get down, I mean, the, the message has got to be, this is about implementation and action, perhaps, rather than these uh, lines going into the long-term future that I, I've shown you in, in the previous slides. On the left-hand side, we have adaptation options uh, in, for, in the land use sector. On the right-hand side, mitigation options. And it's an important point to emphasize there are just many options out there that can be realized immediately across the globe that would have a significant impact. First, 
on helping us, uh, 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 us adapt to the inevitable consequences of climate change, and on the right-hand side, also to reduce, reduce emissions. So I'll, I'll do, I mean, as I'm more familiar with the mitigation options part of it, let me just flag out what these options are. And the colour code on the right-hand side actually refers to the cost of implementing these measures. The, the, if there is any blue, and there is none for, for this land use part, there are me measures where the costs are negative. In other words, it would make sense to exercise them even if there were no climate change. But globally, overall, about half of the mitigation potential is associated with emission reduction measures that could be achieved at less than $20 per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent, far less, for example, than the price set in the EU emission trading scheme. So for the agri agri agriculture and land use sector, reduced conversion of natural ecosystems is coming up as the biggest ticket option, maybe around 8% of, of global, global emissions currently. Carbon sequestration in agriculture, ecosystem restoration, afforestation, reforestation, which would include peatland restoration, the shift to sustainable, healthy diets, which we also we always approach with a little delicacy, given the, the, the nature of some of the issues around diets, but also improved forest management, reduction of methane and nitrous oxide in agriculture, and reduced food loss and food waste also coming up as, as sufficient uh, significant items. Now, going back to the special report on climate change and land, we do have a tendency to categorise actions into mitigation and adaptation. And one of the things that we did in the special report on climate change and land was make to the important observation that there are perhaps no mitigation and adaptation options. There are only actions that have consequences in terms of both mitigation and adaptation. So you can often solve two problems at once. So instead of dividing measures up by mitigation and adaptation, we divided them up in three different ways. The broad type of measure and land management, which I'll come on to, value chain management, which would include things like managing food loss uh, against supply change, and risk management, which would include items like income diversification in, in rural areas. We also do, uh, classified the measures by the magnitude of the global impact in terms of technical potential, ranging to the very large impact, more than three gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, which is roughly about six, five, six percent of current global emissions, uh, a medium level and a much lower level. And one that I think is very important, dividing the responses up by the impact on competition for land and land use change. If there is no or limited competition for land, that is one type of measure and with certain consequences. But other types of measures rely on considerable amounts of land use change, which has altogether different implications. Now, this is a, this is a figure uh, which we're all, always presented with, which I hesitate to put up on a screen. There is a saying that a good figure uh, saves you a thousand words. There's another one, an IPCC figure takes a thousand words to explain. And uh, th this, is, this is one of these that, that fall into this category. But what this let me explain what the figure was doing, and I won't, won't necessarily go into the detail on it. It was to take all of the responses that were identified for land management, which did not essentially involve land competition, and assess their impact on mitigation, adaptation, desertification, which was part of the land report, land degradation, and food security. And to cut a very long story short, blue is a good thing and orange is a bad thing. Let me, let me summarize it at that particular level. So impressionistically, let's say that there is a, you know, most of these options that don't involve land competition have very good consequences overall in all respects. So improving food productivity, uh, at the agriculture batch at the top, increased food productivity, agroforestry, management of cropland and livestock, etc., all have very positive implications. 
a set of positive implications on forest management, and was, was has already been said by the minister, this question of how we manage soils is a really important part of the picture. Uh, we can adapt to climate change through soil management, and it also helps to mitigate if the soils take up carbon and turn land into a sink for CO2 removal rather than the source that we have at the moment. And uh, just at the bottom of this end, other types of ecosystem management, which includes in different parts of the world fire management, probably not so big in, in Ireland, given, given, given climate maybe, uh, but that also includes uh, restoration and reduced uh, conversion of peatlands, which I should say is also a big issue in Scotland as well at the moment. And on the just transition, we've made several visits there. So I'm sure you'll excuse me for not going through this slide in excruciating detail, but, uh, but, but that is a, a very positive picture about the multiple benefits that can arise from land use, land use actions. The same is not so true where you, in, you have uh, options that involve lots, lots of land use change. And the one about which there has been lots of controversy in IPCC has the question of which many of the global scenarios rely on the use of bioenergy associated with carbon capture and storage, where it can have a big blue positive mitigation effect. But if we are converting agricultural land for forestry on a very, very large global scale, there are certainly implications for food security as well as biodiversity that need to be uh, taken in, into account. But a lot of it depends on how it's done, what kind of land is chosen for the conversion and how, how the land is, is managed. Now, I've, I've got one more, one more slide that... Uh, that has sort of numbers and figures on it. One of the things that we did in the uh, synthesis report and also in the underlying working group three report was to look at the degree to which investment flows are moving in the right direction for realizing the kind of changes that we would need to meet the Paris Agreement goals. And the blue, the blue splashes on the left-hand side basically show current flows of finance for mitigation and the grey bars, with a huge range of uncertainty, I should say, show the flows that would be needed uh, by 2030 in order to limit warming to, to, the, uh, to the Paris goals. And uh, I think the big measure is there are gaps in absolutely every sector, but the gaps are actually lowest for renewable energy, where costs have fallen considerably and private investment flows have started to move. The gaps are bigger for efficiency and transport, but in relative terms, they are biggest, it's the biggest gap lies for agricultural, forestry, and other land use, where bundling up financial flows is a real challenge to very get it off into smallholders, people who need to make investments. And the big uh, finance companies that won't get out of bed for less than $100 million basically find it difficult to deal with smaller projects. And a big problem is going to be aggregation of, of individual projects. There is enough money in the world to address climate change. The problem is channeling the money into the right places and creating the right incentive structures. So I'm going to end with just, ju just a few final messages from the special report on climate change. Uh, climate, it's not climate change itself. Human beings are already putting big stresses on land. So climate change is making a challenging system worse. And the act, kind of actions that we could take at a very large level, they could undermine food, food security if not done carefully. By better land management cannot only support climate action. It can support biodiversity uh, uh, conservation, again a point with which the Minister has raised, and the way that we produce our food matters, and dietary choices can help reduce emissions and pressure on land. And believe me, we talked about how to message this extremely carefully in the special report on climate change and land. We put diet on the agenda, but every time the word diet appeared, the word choice appeared after it, because it's not our, our job as scientists to tell people what to eat. It's a, it's a deli delicate cultural issue. Uh, and a final message that the land that we are already using could feed the world 
in a changing climate and provide biomass for renewable energy, but we need to act early on it and we need to act across se uh, several fronts. So, final message, land's undergoing human pressure. It is definitely part of the solution, but land can't do it all and action for fossil fuels and energy will be absolutely critical. And I will complete my remarks there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim, for a very interesting presentation. And there'll be an opportunity a little later in the session for Q&A. But we'll move directly to the next speaker, Mary Frances Rochford from the EPA will provide a short overview of Lulu CF emissions reporting and its place in Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions profile. Thanks, Mary Frances. Thank you very much, Brian, and uh, thank you very much, Jim. It's a, a real privilege and honour to, to share the podium with um, an eminent scientist and contribution that um, the IPCC makes to our understanding of the climate change challenge. So, um, as Brian introduced, um, I'm going to speak to you about the EPA perspective, greenhouse gas emissions inventory and, and Lulu CF emissions and where they, play, they fall in relation to our understanding of the climate change challenge. And as you are aware, the EPA has a number of roles in relation to climate change and climate change action and engagement, ranging from our emissions inventories and projections, our behavioural insights, and Laura mentioned the climate change in the Irish Mind study, the work that we do in relation to adaptation, the research aspect in terms of how we understand the challenge and the minister highlighted the role of climate scientists and indeed all scientists in terms of understanding um, climate, the climate challenge. But today I'm going to focus on quite a narrow aspect of, of the work that we do in relation to our emissions inventories and projections. And going, I guess, from some of the, the really global high level discussion um, that we had from Jim, um, I'm going to bring it down to, to quite, uh, as I said, a narrow and detailed focused um, discussion, but I want to just assure you, or, or reassure you perhaps, I'm not going to dwell too much in relation to the, to the figures, but rather to give some insight in relation to the how and the what we do. The feedback that we've got in, in recent months is that, that people would like to understand a little bit more about the work that the EPA does in its role as an accountant, so to speak, in relation to our greenhouse gas inventories and projections. And as it's been highlighted, this is a, a complex space. So what I'm going to try today to do is to cut through some of that complexity so that we can understand what we know and what we need to know in order to um, be able to verify our move towards net zero emissions. So as I set out, the, the EPA has a, a role in relation to the compilation of inventories and projections. And we do this in relation to um, our international and our, our national requirements. Um, we have a role in relation to the monitoring and verification. Uh, how, how are our climate actions um, addressing climate change? So as we look at our inventories, it's essentially a look back in relation to, to what we're doing, what our emissions have been, and we look back across the time series in relation to that. And then we look forward in relation to our projections. And that's taken account of the measures and the actions that are already been taken, are in, that are in place and underway, and what are the impact of those as we look out to 2030 and beyond. But then there's also another scenario, what we call the with additional measures scenario. And that takes account of the, the actions that we say we are going to take. So, for example, the actions that are set out in the most recent Climate Action Plan in, in 2023 as highlighting we're, we're going to take these measures and as part of the EPA's um, projections work, we take account of that and, well, you know, if all of these were implemented, what would that do and how far along will that bring us in relation to, to meeting our national ambition? We report our emissions um, under... By, by gas, and again, you know, just to, to reiterate, when we're doing that, we look at carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the other gases, the F gases, which are, are smaller but in, in, in number, but, but still no less significant. And then we look at it by sector, and everybody will be you know, familiar and able to, to connect with the sectors, as Jim outlined, in relation to our energy sector, 
our residential sector, we talk about our agriculture and transport sector, which, which we know are large sectors. And then Lulu CF. And you know, I, on, a, on a very personal level, uh, before I came into to working in this space, it, it meant nothing. Is it Luff? Is it Luff? Is it, how, how do you say it? What is it? And I, I, you know, how do you visualize what, what it actually is? And you know, as Jim said, and Laura have, has said out, the Lulu CF sector, the land use, land use change in forestry sector, and it combines forest, grassland, cropland, wetland, settlements, other lands and harvested wood products. Essentially, what's growing above the ground, below the ground, the dead organic matter, the, the litter, the dead wood, the leaves that are there. And then it takes account of the soils in, in which all of this activity is happening. The type of soil, the mineral, is it mineral soil, is it an organic peat soil, or is it something in between when we look at the, the organomineral soils? And I'm sure a soil scientist will say that is not how you would describe it. But today I'm trying to appeal to the masses so that we all have an understanding. It is then also in relation to, sorry, to uh, as we take account within the, the sector and, and lead with all the sectors, when we try to think about the emissions that are coming from, 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 from this web of activities, if you bring it back to its very basic, what it is is around the activity. What is it that we're doing? Is it you know, the, the acreage of, of forest land that we have? Is it the number of cows we have? Is it the number of the type of, of um, fuel that we're burning? And you multiply that by an emission factor. And of course, when it comes to the land use and land use change um, sector, we're thinking about this. It, it is a little bit more complicated because we're thinking about the emissions that are going out and we're thinking about then what the emissions are being removed from the atmosphere, what's been contained by these activities that we're taking account of. Then it gets a little bit more confusing, and I, I'm not going to, to go too far down this rabbit hole, but when we think about land use change and land use change in forestry, there's kind of two aspects to it that's important for us. One is around the emissions themselves that are being emitted or sequestered. The what goes out, what comes in, what's the balance in simple accounting terms. Then up to this point, there has been a more complicated and complex accounting mechanism at an EU and a, 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 at a UN level. And that's the bit where everybody's eyes glaze over and I'm not going to go too far there other than to say that land, because of the the particular situation in which, you know, our, our, the particular type of land we have in Ireland, the particular type of activities when you look at our agriculture sector, we get a certain credit. And the land use sector and the actions that we take in that sector in order to reduce our emissions over a certain period of time helps us to meet our target at the end. But I take it back a little bit and just say that, you know, for the purposes of where we're you know, what we're talking about in terms of meeting net zero emissions. What's important is what's going out, what's being captured or, or taken in and held in in, our, in, in, our, in our, our land use sector. And what can we do about that? And how then are these actions that we're being asked to take and, and, and that, that are causing, you know, that needs discussion and are being discussed and what, how will they then get reflected in the inventory is a question that, that we're asked quite a lot. So one of the things that, that's important, I, I think, to, to reiterate that as we produce these set of accounts, we, do, we, we take account of, of these, we compile these figures based on international guidelines coming from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that Jim spoke of earlier. It's important that as we compile these, this information, that how we go about this is transparent, that it's clearly explained in terms of both the methods that we follow and the assumptions that we make. And that is a challenge as I go back to, to Luff or Luff or Lulu CF. The accuracy is really important. So there's a measure of accuracy, that, there's a measure of exactness when it comes to this. So we have to be careful that we neither overestimate or underestimate as, as we compile these figures, that we are consistent that in both in terms of internally and how we go about doing that and 
but also as we identify um, new understanding in terms of the science and the, the, the technologies and, and, and the, you know, as the Minister said, we get that insight in relation to what's happening under the ground and in the ground and in, in, that, in our environment, then that we're consistent. So where we find out about this new science, that we're able to update and apply this these new emission factors and then put it back through the, um, through the, the time series so that we have that understanding. So if we find out something today, that doesn't mean that we're not going to get credit for this better understanding. But we do need to remember that as we find out you know, that maybe something has less of an emission than we thought previously, we also find, and I'll give some examples in a moment, about how our understanding shows that some of what we do actually means that we're emitting more than we previously thought. These figures are all reviewed and audited at an international, uh, sorry, I should just say that it's also important that they're comparable, we can compare ourselves to other countries, and as Jim highlighted the importance uh, of, of the part that we're playing in, in, the, in the global context, and then that they're complete, that they cover all the missions that take place in Ireland. And then they're reviewed and they're audited at a, an international level by the UN and the, the EU. And our latest published data is 2021, and the next, uh, the 2022 inventory will be produced later this, later this summer. As I said then, the projections piece is where we look forward. There's models involved. And then, as I outlined, it, I have already outlined the, the with existing measures and additional measures, but we also carry out some sensitivity to make sure that the, the, there's a rigor to what we're doing and as you adjust these, um, the, the, the assumptions that, that we can see the impacts that that can have. And then the why piece that, that we're doing this. It's in the, the context of our national ambition and the Minister and Laura have, have both referred to that, so I won't dwell on it. They play, the, the EPA's reports, the inventories and projections have a role within, this, within our national um, climate governance. And this is why you know, the, the, the flow of information from the okay, looking at our ambition in terms of what we want to do, the budgets that are there in the sector of ceilings that support us in relation to meeting those targets, and then the actions in terms of the, the annual cycle of the Climate Action Plan, all are incorporated in relation to the work that we do. So then there's the, the piece around that, that we often get asked about is, you know, is land use and, and land use change, is this sector a new um, feature in relation to the EPA's um, inventories and projections? And I guess the, the short answer there is that it's not. It's something that we have been reporting on and, and working on as part of our EU and UN commitments for, for quite a while. What it's not, hasn't been, has been part of our EU um, target in relation to our effort sharing decision. The, the trajectory in terms of the importance of LULUCF at, in the international context you know, came through in, in particular in relation in, in the discussion and the, the Paris, around the Paris Agreement. And this put an emphasis on LULUCF and the importance in terms of removals in, in meeting our, 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 our global climate ambition. But it also encouraged a less complex approach. And when it moved then in terms of the EU um, regime, we had a new regulation that in 2018, and that set out an approach in which to deal with LULUCF. However, this was still a complicated um, approach, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it. But there's a new regulation now, which is, is soon to be adopted, and that incorporates the rules for some of the, the more complex rules that are for the period out to 2025, but then a new approach out to, to 2030. And this sets a reduction value for Ireland. It allows for the technical amend, uh, corrections. So those um, corrections that I said about the, the, the new the, and emerging science. And it also sets out a budget and, a, and requires a linear, linear trajectory in order for us to meet our 2030 target. So what does this look like in terms of our emissions profile in, in Ireland? And what we see is, uh, as Laura ha has highlighted, the land use, land use change in forestry sector makes up 11%, just over 11% of the 69.3 million tonnes 
um, that, that was uh, identified in, in our 2021 inventory. And that's, you're just shy of 8 million tonnes, 7.7 million tonnes. And you see there, the, just to, to bring you through, and as Laura said, it has been a net source of CO2 equivalent emissions in all years from 1990 out to, to 2021. And just there then you can see in relation to the sources of our greenhouse gas emissions within the sector, the largest there in terms of our grasslands. What it looks like then in terms of the, the numbers, um, and you can see there in terms of the, the balance and where we've got some, where, where we have our, our removals and where we have our, our emissions across the profile from forest land, cropland, grasslands, wetlands, settlements and other land. And just then, just to bring you through, as you see then, as the, the profile of our, our emissions ha have been changing over time, back from 1990 through to 2020, and then as we look out to 2030. And one of the key changes that we see there within the, within the projections, we're seeing the impact of the um, peatland restoration work, rehabilitation work, and we're also seeing the impact in the changes in our forest land as well. So we're seeing that as a result of our, the, 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 as a result of our, our lower levels of, um, of afforestation in recent years, we're seeing that our current forest stock is coming to a time when it's going to, to no longer provide that sink that has been so valuable to us in relation to our emissions profile. When we look then in terms of what we're going to, to do as a country and what's set out in relation to addressing this, these issues, the Climate Action Plan 2023 provides an indication of the activities and the type of effort that's required. Right across from our forestry sector, the croplands, grasslands and wetlands. And we see that it is no mean feat in, in relation to, to the achievement of these. And what is important in, in this respect from, is to take account of what the science is telling us in relation to, to these activities. And, and how these then will contribute towards our national ambition. The data sources, which links just to, to the previous slide, and how we're going to account for these levels of activity are many, wide and varied. And spatial mapping plays a huge role to understand where are, are these emissions coming from? Where are, like, do we have a good understanding of the, the types of um, the, the types of, uh, of biological environment that, is, uh, that are either a sink or a source in relation to our emissions. And so, we're, we're, and just to, uh, rather than, than me going into to too much detail in relation to it now, as the day goes on, we'll hear from some of our, our speakers in relation to our spatial mapping, in relation to some of the, the monitoring that's happening at a local, uh, and, uh, on the ground as well, in relation to to understanding both the, in terms of the, the work that we have now, but also in terms of understanding the impact of these future measures. And just to, to highlight the, the types of mapping, we've got Kareen, we've got the new land cover map, which Gavin and Rachel will speak of in the afternoon. And then also we have the importance when we look at, 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 um, um, at, at satellite imagery. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and remote sensing work. The type of information that we gather from this type of exercise brings us through what is, in terms of, the, uh, of our inventories and projections, that higher level of knowledge and that higher insights. And within the inventory and projection sphere, this, these are known as, as different tiers. So you go from your tier one, your book value, so to speak, in, in relation to well, you know, th this is your, your baseline in, in terms of what the emission could be. It's not particular to, to Ireland or, or to, to a given country, but then it works all the way through in terms of the development of our science and our technology and the type of spatial understanding that we have in the land use sector to be able to go to tier three where we have a much better understanding of the, the emission factors that are associated with particular activities, but also the scale, the breadth of activities that, that are there so that they're fully reflected within the inventory itself. This refinement process 
is perfectly normal in relation to the, the inventory and projection, the, the accounting process. And Ireland is not alone when it comes to the need to, to refine and to, to um, update its inventories and projections. It's a reflection of our, our developing our understanding and having a good science and, and knowledge base in, um, that supports our inventories and projections. It is key that these are reportable, monitor, measurable and verifiable and that, there, that there's ongoing engagement with stakeholders as we're going through this process and that there's a clear approach for how this happens, how does something get reflected in, in, in the inventory. And it must stand up to scrutiny both at an EU level and at the, the, at the UN level. And what we see, in, like I, I referred to it earlier, we've seen in, in recent times the, our improved understanding of the impact of drained organic soils and forest land, and a new tier two emission resulted in an, in an increase in our understanding of emissions and an increase of about approximately 30% um, in relation to above what, what we previously thought was emitted from these types of, uh, of, of settings. We've also included in recent times an, an update in relation to exploited wetland, and then we've also included soil um, changes in relation to the soil that are under settlements. So these are all quite normal. And then they're also reflected within legislation. So in, at, at an EU level, what we're seeing is that new, the new LULUCF regs require improvements in knowledge. And they actually push for an enhanced understanding of science, including spatial mapping and reducing uncertainty. With that longer term goal then, that this additional information will help inform um, transparency around carbon farming and removal certifications, etc., into the future. So to do this, um, from a, there's lots of work happening at the moment um, in terms of spatial land use mapping, and we, we'll hear about the land cover map shortly. We also have work on, underway in the EPA in relate, looking specifically at land use, land use change in forestry and the, the spatial understanding that we have there in order to support our inventories and projections. We have a broad um, EPA research programme that takes account of peatlands, looks at hedgerows, and many people ask the question, are hedgerows in the, the inventory and projections? They're in there. Um, we've got take account of biomass burning. There's research through the Department of Agriculture and others, and indeed research um, undertaken by Chagask. The land use review, which has been mentioned previously this morning, and the, uh, you know, to, to look at those recommendations, to, to break the, maybe look at them in, in, in three headings, if you look at the monitor recommendations there around monitoring and the recommendations to develop monitoring networks to collect and expand data available, the mapping capability, and then the design and application of evidence. And all of these would have a significant impact and benefit in relation to our emissions inventories and projections. So I am sure I am close to time. So to, to say I, I didn't dwell too much in relation to, to the numbers the feedback that we've been getting is that people like to, to understand how we're doing this, and I, I'm, I'm more than, than happy to take questions. Thank you very much. So just looking at the time, we have about 10, maybe 15 minutes for questions. Uh, there'll be some coming through on the screen here, which I'll pick up on, but in the room, does anyone want to raise a hand? Uh, I see a hand there. Um, uh, we might take two or three questions together in groups, if that's okay, so uh, if, if people want to put their hands up. Uh, hi, thanks very much, Mary Francis. That was a great presentation and covered an awful lot very clearly. I have one question in terms of uh, land use and land use change in forestry, uh, specifically uh, wetlands. Um, for organizations um, all looking at low carbon planning and specifically forecasts for, for the emissions, at the moment, wetlands are a, uh, a source of significant emissions, as you pointed out to us. Um, for the rewetting of bog lands, peat lands, that provides island with 
um, a big win in terms of sequestering um, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide. But to incentivize that at the moment, um, within the National Inventory Report, that's kind of lost, um, it's obscured rather, within the larger um, land use category of wetlands because they're a big emitter. So are there any plans by the EPA to provide a, a subcategory for re-wetted um, uh, bogs, peatlands, which are sequestering or can sequester? Because that will incentivize more organizations to perhaps invest their time uh, and money uh, and effort in, in more of these projects nationally. Uh, I'd be interested in the EPA's thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. We might take one or two other questions uh, and then come to the panel. And if people, you've limited time, keep the questions as short as they can. Um, my name is Claire and I'm a student of horticulture at the moment. Um, I'm not sure who to direct the question to, I suppose to Minister Ryan, if that's okay, seeing as you're a minister and you might have the capacity to take action. Um, I was very surprised with, uh, nobody referred to cap reform, and also Ireland has one of the lowest levels of land under organic farming currently, I think it's less than 7%, and we have a huge reliance on beef and dairy farming, and we produce very little of our own fruit and vegetables, so I think we have huge potential um, to change but I'm kind of uh, keen to see action on the ground. And also we have a huge reliance on imported synthetic fertilizers. We produce very little of our own growing media in horticulture. We import Klausmann's as a product from Germany while we export our peat. Uh, and we rely on peat a lot still. And we really need to get away from that and have our own resilience in producing um, our own growing media, our own seed stock with Brexit and our ridiculously low rate of growing our own fruit and vegetables in organic farming. So how are we going to address these tangible actions on cap reform? Thanks. And I think we'll take one more question. And again, thanks uh, before we go to the panel. And again, ask people if they could keep the questions as, as short as possible, because uh, time is limited. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, Bobby Lambert is the name. Um, great presentations, but I had a question for Jim uh, about your reluctance to engage at the demand end of all of this, which is the food we consume. And I noted your reluctance to engage in that, but surely that is a, a crucial responsibility of scientists with given the scale of the crisis we face, uh, especially combating the cultural choices we make in eating food and the huge marketing, marketing machine that drives us towards that. And surely it's time not to be to lose that shyness and take the gloves off, because we need action, as the minister said, we need it now. So it'd be good to hear your response on that and encourage you to be less shy about that. So, thanks very much. We'll give the panel a chance to come back, maybe with the minister first, Jim, and then Mary Francis. I might answer Claire's point, and I think it's a valid uh, point you made, Claire, that our level of organic farming compared to other European similar countries is very low. It has doubled in the last two and a half years, and I think that's only going one way because I think the benefits of switching away from that use of nitrogen uh, fossil-based fertilizer towards really kind of better sophisticated management systems using uh, slurry and other mechanisms of fertilizing uh, land to reduce costs, to improve soil health, to improve biodiversity on the farm, and, and then get that premium that I think we can get. Our, our farming, a lot of particular our farming systems are not that far away from organic status, particularly on the um, less intense farms, more than the west and north particularly. I don't think it would take, it's a huge change for us to be able to make, to make that leap. And, and I think a lot of farmers are starting to see that now. And I think you look at the number of people turning up farm visits for organic farms, there's hundreds turning up. I think they realize, particularly with the high price of fertilizers, but not just that, that, that it makes sense for us to make the switch. Thanks, Minister. Jim. 
Yeah, I, I think it was the, the third question that was directed uh, directly at me. And can, can I just say, IPCC is not an advocacy organisation, but I can assure you we did not shy away from the issue of diets uh, in that special report on climate change in land. It was more a question of how we said it. So we did not say, eat less meat. We pointed out that more plant-based diets, if taken up, would result in uh, lower levels of greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we also pointed out the link with health issues, because frankly, if people followed doctor's orders uh, in terms of diets, they, it would result in diets that had a lower uh, carbon footprint. So we did not absolutely duck away from it. And can I just say, in the, in the weeks after that report was published, I had plenty of opportunity to go onto very popular radio and TV shows and talk about the issue of diet change without directly telling people what to eat. We got it onto the agenda, but we did not take an advocacy position. Thanks, Jim. Mary Francis. Yeah, so in relation to, to that, that spatial work, um, some of the work that we're doing internally in the EPA will bring us to a very granular level in relation to being able to identify um, changes in land use. Um, so I would think that I'd love to, to talk to, to you more in relation to, to the need that you're identifying there because I think there's something that we should do uh, we sh and we should be able to do. Um, and one of the things that we are you know, really looking at is in relation to the communication of our inventories and projections and in order to, to support the national ambition as well to make sure that the, the breakdowns that we have are fit for purpose at a, a national and an EU and, and, and international level as well. So I'd love to understand a little bit more about the, the granularity of what you're looking for, but I, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Thanks, Mary Francis. We might take another couple of questions from the floor and then I'll take one off the screen as well. So uh, I think we have some hands raised. Miriam Samper, Community Gardens Ireland Committee member. Just in relation to the land use, um, I know um, probably the Minister Malcolm Nuna, who is not here today, will be able to give more indications of this. But just considering the importance of community gardens and allotments in relation to land use, I wanted to hear from the panel. In relation to this, has been any, I suppose, um, statistics uh, proven of the importance of of having, um, I suppose, as it was mentioned before, um, consider this for the statistics, or is there any way to have any any data on this? Okay. Um, uh, any more hands over here? I think. And there's one Sorry, at the back Emma, as well. Emma Finn. I'm a beekeeper. Um, in relation to the hedgerows, uh, I was just wondering. We have 750,000 kilometres of them and they seem to disappear quite often. Um, so I was wondering about increased protection for them. And also the use of chemicals in different areas, especially around cities, as I have a large number of bees dying every day and I can see that they've been poisoned. So is there any plans to decrease this or to deny more permissions for fertilizers and chemical use? Thanks very much and we'll take one more from the floor. Uh, there's a few raised hands. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Just in relation to the inventory, and uh, Minister Ryan referred to uh, changes in the science as we understand things, uh, I'm aware that Chagas are, have been uh, carrying out huge amounts of research in relation to the estimations of methane, um, and I, I think they're going through the peer review process now. But I'd love to understand uh, how and when those might be implemented in terms of the overestimation of, of methane. And the question arose in relation to the IPCC moving towards you know, a different, perhaps multiplying factor for methane. I wonder how that might impact our, A, our national inventory, and B, you know, what our land use requirements, uh, how they might shift and change as a result of that too. Thanks very much for that question. And just one off the screen here for the minister. 
Minister, you might want to comment on the opportunity of carbon farming for Ireland and then any of the other questions you might want to respond to. Yeah, well, I think what I was speaking in my own words earlier is very much that that's where we want to go. We want to go to be able to provide an income for farming from nature-based solutions as one of a stream of different incomes, you know, in from agroforestry, from energy, from carbon farming, from, from uh, getting a premium for more organic, less intensive. In my mind, that's the direction of our future direction and the best strategy for Irish agriculture. Can I just make one point, just adding to that question about community gardens? and Because and, I think it is about this, and particularly the nature restoration law, which is such, such, such controversy at the moment. Actually, it's as critical for the urban areas as well as rural. And if I give an example, there was a project we, we launched on Monday, which I think is an example of to take up the, the suggestion around how we think about this in a garden, in an urban context. We, we, um, the MPWS are going to do a restoration project starting now in the Glenismol Valley, the upper reaches of the River Dodder. 2,000 hectares, really good management of the peatlands, of the blanket bogs, so that we store the carbon there, but also we hold the water back, mm -hmm. and, and so that we don't have to spend so much on big, intrusive urban flood systems, and, and also then uh, enclosing land or um, fencing off land so that there's a natural regeneration of forest and planting and working with farmers in that. Local farmers have been absolutely integrated in, so they're still grazing, part of the management, really kind of developing this really good management of the land. But it doesn't finish at the Bourne Breen Dam. In my mind, we need to follow all 26 kilometers of that river, and, and it's happening in Tala and elsewhere. Communities get really good now at looking how we could put in wetlands in urban areas, how we can garden in a way collectively that brings a biodiverse urban environment as well as a rural environment. So it's, on our climate ambitions and on our climate approach, every place matters, every person matters, everyone is in the front line has, and has an opportunity to shine in terms of how we make that chain. Aina Nilana launched a book last year. She has a pocket garden the size of the tiny the, the area there. But actually in that you can do things that inspire you and improve that local environment. So. So I think it's, it, yes, it's carbon farming, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's right the way through every single environment we need to start to think about how we restore nature in it. Thanks, Minister. And Jim and uh, Mary Francis, if you want to respond to any of the, the questions. Do you, do you want me to, me to go? I'll just pick up the one about uh, changes in the science. On, just to make one point, it's not IPCC that chooses the metrics to turn methane emissions into carbon dioxide equivalent. The Framework Convention does it itself based on evidence from IPCC, which has numbers for a variety of timescales, 20, 50, 100 years. But it is a live topic, and the Convention has asked for a briefing from IPCC at Bonn in a subsidiary uh, meeting in two weeks' time for a briefing on metrics, because this is a, a very live issue. Could I, I just comment more generally on this changes in science issue? Because I do detect sometimes a bit of a culture clash between science and politics here when we're trying to integrate it. And I remember occasions when the changing science really messed up the UK's and Scotland's climate targets. And I recall Lord Deben, who was chairing our Climate Change Committee, just coming down and saying, why can't these bloody scientists make up their mind, basically? Because it would make life an awful lot simpler. <coughs> and we, but we need, do need to build in systems, which I think the EU system does, because it allows for these, these te technical changes. I'll just say one last thing. If I was in the audience and had a question for Mary, it would be a question about the use of atmospheric observation to test and proof uh, the question of emissions. Can you make observations of the concentrations of methane in the atmosphere and reverse model to find out what kind of emissions would have resulted in these concentrations? And I think that's an approach that could actually help us a lot uh, judge whether we are overestimating or underestimating emissions associated with our methodologies. Yeah, and I, I might just say in relation to, to that, um, Ireland has recently become a, a full member of ICOS. Um, so part of that um, international, that, that carbon observation system, so that's very much something that we're, we're engaging with uh, and, and something which we hope to do more of into the future. 
Um, and then also just to, to come back in relation to, to the question um, on methane emissions and research by Chagas, the incorporation of emerging research is something which is part of the bread and butter, the day-to-day the -day piece of, of generating the, the inventories and projections. And as soon as the, the research comes through, that you mentioned it's in that peer um, review process, we look at it and we, we definitely don't hold back in, in relation to our consideration of those. And indeed, we have, um, we're, we're regularly on steering committees in relation to, to emerging research um, and, and engage in the early stages as emerging um, findings are, are coming through so that we're, we're not coming in a, at the end. But in relation to that particular piece of research, that hasn't come through to the EPA yet. Um, but we do have examples of, of where we have incorporated research such as this before, um, particularly in the agriculture inventories. If you look at, the, there was a, a breakdown of dung and urine, um, and that was something which came into the inventories, and we saw when they came in that it had a, an overall impact of a reduction in inventories from that particular sector. So it's something that we're comfortable doing uh, and that we engage with the scientists in relation to it. Thanks very much, Mary Francis. I'm very conscious of time, and I was given very strict instructions uh, to finish on time. So I'll bring this session to a close. I want to thank the Minister very much, Jim, and Mary Francis um, for their input this morning, and thank you for your questions. And I've also been told that, that you're to be back here sharply at 11.30 for the next session. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.